Hey pilots, have a video for you about the JL1A today. I'm a little late getting this out. I'd hoped to do it before it went off sale, uh, but uh, unfortunately that did not happen. So it's sort of an after the fact uh, post-mortem. If you picked it up and you are curious about it or how to set it up, or you did not pick it up and you're seeing them in the skies and wanna know how can I get a handle on this aircraft, Hopefully this video will help you. I've got two replays, one from the client and one recorded through OBS. Um, the first one showing you its offensive potential, potential as an offensive light fighter, which I think is the way to use the JL-1A best. Or the second video shows you its defensive potential, uh, trying to lock down a single zone. I don't think it does that quite as well, um, just because of the nature of the plane, but I do think it's a solid plane. If memory serves, this was the first jet aircraft that was a premium at tier eight, and I think it still holds its own today, which is uh, one of the reasons why um, I think it was, you know, is still a great plane to pick up and, uh, and to fly with. Its speed is incredible, and the firepower, which you can see in this one pass on the aircraft there, the 37 and the 223 is a familiar setup for me as I've been working on the MiG-9, uh, but also a good combination if you can make the guns work. And I wouldn't say that's a weakness of the plane, but it is something to keep in mind. Uh, I will say here, um, you see how well this plane keeps and holds and accelerates, right, speed-wise. It accelerates quickly. It's got a very powerful engine and a great thrust, um, and it also uh, maintains that speed fairly well. So I'm going to turn into this 262. I was kind of baiting him a little bit, hoping to get the head on or helping him turn on, but he just sort of ignored me, and so it was my chance to go after him. But those guns don't always one pass things and goner there in the background is able to clean up the zone while i'm trying to finish off uh, ecro erco uh, erco so uh, unfortunately they get the jump on the zone we're down two zones to one <clears throat> i want this bomber because um, i don't want him moving to the next zone <laughs> and, <clears throat> and and uh, capping us you know moving it to a, a three to one, but fortunately, Sandy, who's my other pilot on my team, manages to flip this zone, and so I just let the bomber go and move on. I wanna try and hit that uh, other garrison on the side there. It is a two air base, three garrison um, battle, and you can see Sandy there using his LA-7 to its optimal potential as a defensive fighter, getting in the center zone, kind of locking it down, picking off, crop, picking off aircraft that come through, and making short work of them. This is a, because of the acceleration on this thing, I usually climb at a little higher angle than I do other planes because I find I can still um, traverse horizontally across the map while gaining that altitude. And this plane does prefer to be at high altitude, certainly uh, because weakness number one is that it doesn't turn very well. Um, it struggles with that. And so you have to kind of make passes like I've done there. And you know, if you don't have the guns kind of in tow, um, it makes it a little tougher to kind of <laughs> one pass things. I think if you specialize the aircraft, that goes away. You have access to much better equipment, obviously. And I do have a rather unusual equipment setup on this. I think most people would use a gun sight, <clears throat> and that is certainly the standard play here. Mine is a little off meta uh, because I feel like the best way to help the guns is by improving the auto aim angle rather than the general accuracy of the guns. I have a navigational equipment on right now. Also helps a little bit with view range, but really it's because I can do the improved version of it and still get the bonus. And that improved version, one of the bonuses is accuracy at moving targets. You could use the G-Suit to do that as well. Uh, I've done that on the Key 162, but the maximum optimal speed on this plane, the speed at which it can get to uh, before losing its maneuverability, as you can see, is over 700. There's just no need for a G-Suit. I think it's like 720. So uh, the navigational equipment seem better. Once it's specialized, I probably revert to the gun sight. I will do a video on this in the future though. I have a sneaky suspicion that the accuracy against moving targets or what we call auto aim is much more important for landing shots than the general accuracy of the guns overall. And that's in part because of how RNG works in wargaming titles. Um, and like I said, I need a full video to go through that. So back through the center here, um, I see Goner and uh, Ekbo uh, both uh, in that garrison zone, trying to flip it. I want to finish off this TU-2. I was hoping to keep him from flipping the zone. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to do that, but we're going to clear him off and then go help Sandy, who I think is in that zone. Actually, no, Sandy, yeah, just got shot down by a TL. But I do feel fairly confident going into this zone. 
um, especially if I get the jump here that I can maybe knock out the LA-9 in one pass and then outturn the 262, something to that effect. Um, and generally I would go for the highest plane. I would generally go for the Hornet here, um, but I'm more concerned about Goner. I know he's a good pilot and uh, I don't want to have to deal with two human pilots at the same time, even if I do have altitude advantage because the 262 can wipe that out pretty quickly. So the goal is to get Goner and then turn, the two, six, turn to the 262 and deal with him. Fortunately, as I said, or unfortunately for me, Goner is a pretty good pilot and he does a duck and weave under me. I take a, the rest of the pass to put a few shots at, or, well, and then I make a huge mistake here. I should extend away. You can see I'm pointing southeast on the map. I should just extend away, use my speed, um, come back in. Most likely, Goner stays and flips the zone. If Ekbo follows me, you know, I can outmaneuver him, hopefully. That's what I should have done. Instead, I, for whatever reason, went brain dead for a minute, and I nose up almost straight up in the air, like 90. And then I realized, oh my gosh, what am I doing? I'm giving him better shots, right? And you can see Goner immediately notice that, turns around and is closing the gap. And I've lost speed and Ekbo has also uh, closed the gap and is turning on me. And so I lose uh, my engine. And this is the second uh, weakness of the plane. The first is its lack of maneuverability, um, which we'll go into in a little bit. But the second is its, its damage resistance is fairly low. And especially once you start putting your kit on it, your gear, the gear that you want to make it more maneuverable or faster or whatever else, that also increases vulnerabilities. Uh, it just takes a lot of damage. And after playing it this week, I'm fairly convinced I might move the extra boost, the boost cooler into an engine restarter just to avoid situations like this. I'm dead right now. There's no getting out of this. Uh, 2v1, one aircraft more maneuverable, one aircraft uh, more quick. I can't do it. I'm able to just barely um, uh, avoid the 262's guns, but that makes me a broadside target for Goner's LA-9. And down we go. So we're up 50 points, uh, a little more, 130 points, but we're also down in terms of zones. And just, uh, just a reminder here for people, right? Um, this little number up in the corner above the B-32 that you can see here is 1024. That means from Sandy's point of view, his guns are out of range. He's not going to do a lot of damage there. And also, we're already in the yellow going to the red. The LA-7 is much better at turn fighting. It is technically a hybrid on paper like the Spitfires are, uh, but it's um, better off kind of being a defensive fighter and holding that one zone. And, uh, and so, uh, but I can understand, I think Sandy just spawned in here. He's taking some pot shots at the B-32, which is already low on health. And hopefully that helps our bots take it down and get rid of it. But I do click the middle zone to indicate that I would like for him to head back there, uh, where I think he can flip the zone and do a lot of good. While he's doing that, hopefully, I need to clear out this zone because the airbase is pretty critical of the two zones we have left. Um, hanging on to it. I missed the pass there, still dialing these guns in a little bit. Um, and unfortunately, it's going to take me longer than thought. But fortunately, my bots are on, on uh, top of things, so I'm able to get in some shots. And then I can just do a little two pass here. A8 goes down, and the 109 I can mostly take down. One thing I do think is helpful is if you do want to split the guns on this to the 23 and the 37, I do. I recommend that. The 30, 23s are on a side button, and then the standard left mouse button just fires everything. That gives me the opportunity to let the 37 cool. These do have a three-second overheat time, which is terrible. You know, it's, it's very short. You have to have great trigger discipline. Um, if you listen in the video, the audio, a lot of times you'll hear me listening for the 37 to fire. Um, there I go for a long burst because I know I'm going to have time to reset. I'm not going to stay with him. But generally, if I'm on someone's tail and I'm firing, you'll hear it go thunk, thunk, thunk. And then you'll hear a pause, thunk, thunk, thunk. I'm letting the 37 get out three or four shots, and then I'm easing off the trigger. I find that easier than counting seconds. So uh, we've managed to flip the middle zone and clean up the airfield, and now we're heading into a furball. It's 2v1. Sandy's in trouble. And I'm going to go help. We're also very close to flipping the zone, which I would like to do. Regain that lead and advantage. We're also eight seconds to squall line. So I do ponder if I wait and pop Goner after the eight seconds are up. But I think the TL is probably going to get him if I don't. And the reality is this is a bad situation. We just need to get these guys out, right, so I can help Sandy. Because I need to keep Sandy alive after the squall line as well. Um, we'd like to have that extra pilot advantage. I dive out here because I thought... Uh, the 262 was going to go head on with me, was going to take a pass at me. I don't think he saw me. Um, I think he's already looping around to take care of Sandy. He wants to finish him off. 
but unfortunately that puts me right on this tail and this plane is more than fast enough to keep up with the 262 and that is squall line and so i've been calling it mechbo i think it's urkbo urko urko i've been calling it mechbo it's urko so urko sorry urko if you're watching my apologies so that puts urko down and uh, that's after squall line uh, which leaves goner at the top of the charts with bots i'm going to try and whittle this down we're up 50 points, we're up three zones to two, so this is the right place, this is where you wanna be at Squall Line, and it allows me to spend a moment working on taking out some of the bomber aircraft, right? And that's helpful because the bot bombers do seem to be at least halfway decent at capping zones most of the time, and so neutering that offensive capability is helpful overall in the match. Uh, this plane does work a little bit as a pocket heavy, taking down bombers, especially bombers when you are up tier uh, in the match. So taking on same tier or lower tier bombers, sevens and eights, it does just fine. And uh, Burger King actually had his video out on this, uh, which I'd recommend. I know the style is very different than mine and that may be off-putting to some people, but I think it's a good demonstration of this plane being a little bit of a pocket heavy. Uh, because of its uh, speed and because of its firepower, it does well uh, knocking down bombers and ground attack aircraft if you need to counter attacks on a mine on a map where that's happening. Uh, Sandy does a great job of lining Goner up for me here, pulling him underneath me, and I'm able to slow down just enough to put a final 37 shots on him and that squall line, so now he's gone as well. And then I inadvertently steal the kill here from Sandy. I kind of got tunnel vision of just like, oh, I can kill this guy before I climb again. Not realizing until the last second that Sandy was already on him. There's only five enemy planes left. There's the A7M here, the 265, which Sandy is headed for at the bottom. And I'm gonna clean up the A7 fairly easily. Uh, nice, steady gunfire is what you want out of these. Um, that's really most helpful. And you want broadside shots if you can, uh, so that you're looking at you know the top of the plane, kind of like here, you see here, where you can see both wings and the fuselage, just to get more surface area to land those shots, those big shells, big damage. The game is wrapped up. I know though, I've got probably 30 seconds left. And so the goal here is just to push my, push my personal points. Uh, up a little bit um, and get some kills because I am working on specializing this, of course. I just finished the 109G and now I'm on to this one. And so that's going to be the goal is just take down, take down these planes with a few seconds left. And fortunately, the great firepower allows you to do that. And this is a good example of splitting the guns where I kind of, I'm going to let uh, both are full and then I'm just going to switch over to just the 23s. Um, and this is a good time to mention those 23s are a really solid um, gun. They are essentially the same as the guns that you have on the Seahawk and the Attacker. So you can see the stats on the screen here. The overheat time is different, of course, um, and a lower um, pure firepower score on the Hispanos. But same bullet speed, roughly the same um, uh, distance, which is actually long range. These are 700 meter plus guns. Um, and then the same um, auto aim stats and accuracy stats as well. So pretty interesting. So this is a match that was more defensive in nature uh, because of the lineup. We are facing three tier eights. We've got two tier eights and a tier nine on ours. Um, and the other tier nines are the F-94D, awesome offensive fighter, not great at defensive, doesn't turn very well either, but you know, not, near, not even as well as this one does, right? And I have this one set up for a maneuver as you can see in the lower corner there. Um, and then also a heavy, and then the enemy team is a ground attacker, a 109TL uh, and a P51H. And so I'm gonna play defensive, I'm gonna try and take the airfield and then do what I can to squat on it. If I get forced off though, I get forced off. We'll see how that goes. But the first thing I wanna do is try and make a dent here. At least give us a fighting chance to take the airfield. And I figure of the three planes, I'm the best man for the job. This is where the grunts hurt when you're trying to get that thin rear profile shot, right? Uh, which again is where I think that auto aim is uh, especially helpful. Uh, just try to put those shots on target a little better. I'm gonna loop over and go ahead and knock him out. And then I'm concerned with the P-51 who has uh, not seen me or whatever. And again, same situation turns to be right in front of me. And I'm just lagging on these 37 shots. You know, reminder, 37 muzzle velocity is slower, so you need to get out further ahead of your shots. Um, and it's also harder when the target is maneuvering, right? So I'm gonna have to go into sniper mode here uh, to finish off this Corsair. But when he turns, you see how much those, and here, see that I got the broadside of him, all those shots land, right? 
And I think once you got specialization, once you got a broader auto aim stat, uh, much better operation. I'm close to getting Marksman 2 on this pilot, uh, which I think will help as well. So we still haven't captured this zone, but we're up two zones to one thanks to the efforts of our teammates. And here's a J7. Uh, he wasn't looking at me, and then a little wiggle, little wiggle of his nose, he's looking at me. <laughs> uh, last video, and I've lost my rudder, by the way, so I'm going to keep pushing forward. And then when <clears throat> he's engaged by the LA-9, um, I'm going to dive underneath and see if I can get back into the zone because I'm going to want to repair in a second here. Somebody asked me in the last video why the Jawas, the J7s, uh, are so maneuverable and they have a 10 plus second turn time. Two things I would say about that. One, they have an incredible uh, rudder uh, and pitch ability uh, because of the way the aircraft is built. Um, it's excellent to do that. And the second thing I would say is um, that the rear mounted engine allows you to thrust into turns when you have those control surfaces and, and the power behind them. So you can whip the nose around pretty quickly. And, and also another reminder, when it talks about turn time on your screen, you say, oh, this eight second turn time, that's 10 second turn time. This one's always gonna beat that one more or less, but you got to remember that's average time to turn 360 degrees. Um, that's not optimal time, right? Or it won't be any worse than this or it won't be any better than that. It's the average time. And so the average time for the J7 is 10 point something, I think. Um, but it can be a whole lot less than that if you use, utilize the controls well. So I did want to pause here to mention this as well as I'm fighting defensively. I do have the airfield in this repair center. The airfield repair center doesn't just give you your HP back. Look in the lower left at my tail, which was damaged earlier, and it's gone. It was yellow, and now it's clear. And this, for me, is one of the real reasons to use that repair center. It's not just the hit points, but when you have a module that's damaged, it has an internal hit point capacity. When it's repaired from red to yellow, it goes back up in its hit points, but only to halfway. And so a part of your plane that is yellow, that is hit again, is much, much easier to damage again, to take out again. And so that repair center not only uh, gives you your general aircraft hit points back, it also gives you your module hit points back. And that can be really important for a plane like this that is often damaged because of its low damage resistance. So keep that in mind, uh, something to take advantage of and to realize in some of these matches. So far, we're doing good. We've managed to keep the airfield. We've kept them out. I've got a 109TL and the P-51 coming in. I can leave the P-51, I'm faster than him. The TL is what I want to deal with first. And so I kind of just stay behind him and you can hear me pumping those shots out. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, right? A little bit of a cooling so I can get a little more sustained DPS out of these guns. And then it's back to climbing again. Um, and that is one of the real advantages of the plane uh, that I think might go overlooked for people. Uh, this plane climbs at 165 meters per second. That's generally more in the territory of uh, tier nine, tier 10 aircraft. That's really good for a tier eight light fighter. Um, and you can utilize that climb ability uh, quite nicely. I leave the LA behind. I'm worried about the 211. These things can sniper stuff out of the air very quickly. I pull off to get the P-51H because he's giving me his side again. Um, and you can see him trying to shoot, but I just swoop away at over 800 KPH and there's nothing much to do. So he goes, goes back to chasing my bot. This gives me another opportunity to hit the 211, and I managed to get him down halfway, but not all the way. Um, I really want to take care of him and then uh, push over to the P-51. Fortunately, that bot LA-9, apparently an ace pilot, because he took down the Jawa earlier and is now skunking a 211. And the P-51 is at a low energy state because he's been down low dogfighting, which is not really the strength of the P-51. Um, although it can do it, it's not as good at it as it is other things. And so I'm able to leave again and then loop over, reset the fight, and come down on him. LA-9 gets him as well. <laughs> so this thing functions okay as a defensive fighter because of that climb rate and the speed and the guns. But it's not nearly as comfortable as something like a Spitfire or whatever else. And here comes another Jawa, and you see him. That's I, I pulled away from him. Doesn't matter. Uh, he whips that nose right around and instantly... Uh, those 30s go to work, and this is a little bit of a fragile plane, so down I go. I go down right as we get superiority, so um, not a big deal, although the airfield is now halfway down. I'm going to try and spawn in before that's out um, and put things, uh, hopefully keep, keep the pedal to the metal here. There are four bots in this zone. We are at squall line now, so it's time to start whittling down the number of enemy aircraft. Again, we're right where we want to be at this. 
And I again select the 211 because I don't want to get uh, one shot by its very large sniper cannons, and I know I can outmaneuver it. Probably outspeed it too. I don't know. I I'm not as familiar with the 211. Um, I have it unlocked, but I have not purchased it and started working on it yet. A little bit of rudder turn there to kind of give me the extra room to be able to put down the 211. And now I need to turn and deal with the other three guys over here, including the P-51. The J-7, the Jawa is almost dead. The bots are working on him. I'm going to go in this pass first for the P-51. We're at Squall Line. I want a pilot that's a real-life human being out of the game. I catch him at the top of the loop when he's slow. And I think I didn't get him. I think the other pilot did, but the bot did. But there you go. And then I use the second half of that uh, diving attack to carry me into that plane and then use my momentum to this third plane. You'll notice when I'm flying, I'm trying to stick to at least 500 kph. I'm trying to keep that speed up um, so that I can have a better shot at staying alive, um, especially in this place. I'm lucky that I didn't get bogged down dealing with Spitfires or something else here that would have been harder for me to kind of um, stay in the zone and take care of business and also deal with them. It kind of forced me to yo-yo up and down and wouldn't be able to use my plane quite as efficiently. So a little bit of uh, sniper view for those of you who uh, like using that. I do use it from time to time myself. And at this point, we're very close to the end of the match, so not much more to do here. Uh, that superiority really did a number on that counter, and it's put us so far ahead that that's just kind of going to be it. I can't even get back to the LA-9 in time to do anything about him. So as you can see, when used as a defensive fighter, this is not as good because it's an energy fighter, because it's an altitude fighter because it has better speed than maneuverability, you're better off using it to capture sectors, go around the map and hit things. Um, if you're up against one of these and you're in a defensive fighter and area denial of a key zone, like an airfield is good. You saw Goner doing that in the last match with his LA-9, kind of sticking around the airfield, right? Uh, making me, forcing me to relocate and burn my time and then taking off for a zone capture, continuing that offensive, uh, but kind of foiling me in the process. And uh, so as a defensive fighter, it's not, not quite as good. It just doesn't have the efficiency to be able to kill quickly because that turn rate is so low. So as you can see here, I've got it set up for maneuver. I've got lightweight wing frame, lightweight power plant, and then the boost. I'm back and forth on this configuration. As I said, I will probably keep the maneuver aspect of it. I'm not sure this plane really needs the boost, though. It's already got incredible thrust. You know, to be able to have the full eight seconds of um, booster instead of the seven that I have now um, with that boost might be helpful because that boost is so strong. So I've considered removing that, putting in some sort of protective gear uh, to get that survivability number up a little bit, uh, make it a little more healthy. Um, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. But uh, overall, this is a great plane. I really do enjoy flying it. If you can do energy fighting, kind of that vertical combat. If not, I've got videos on that. A lot of people do. It's good to learn. Uh, but if you can, this is a great plane to take advantage of. So you need trigger discipline. You need to be able to do energy fighting. But if you can do those things, uh, this will work wonders for you, I think, even in the meta that we have today. Um, it ends up handling pretty well. I didn't record this match, but I did face off against a P-61, um, and that was uh, fairly easy. I had a dive on him. Popped him really hard with the firepower and then just flew away, reset, you know, and come back. Um, and he tried to escape and he can't because I have 100 kph faster than him at the end of the day, right? I ran him down and put him down. So um, this is a, a still very viable plane, even in the meta at tier 8. So good job to my team capturing some zones. Um, you know, I think we did a couple together. And goodness gracious, poor Rotorhead capped five zones in that match and we still got superiority on him. Uh, that's rough, man. He was putting putting in a lot of work as a ground attacker. That's that's hard. It's uh, that's one of the reasons why ground attack can be so frustrating, right? Is you you give your heart and soul and don't get there. Since I was a newer player, and you can see, he did not capture any zones. He continued to try to work on that mid zone. Um, my pro tip in a match like this, if you feel like you cannot, like you're running up against a brick wall in the airfield, I know the airfield is important. Leave it. Um, you're better off capturing the outer ring of zones rather than throwing yourself. Um, needlessly into the center, right? You just end up dying, you get reset, you get halfway there. You don't end up making any progress for your team in the match. You'd be better off going and flipping a zone somewhere. Um, so if you work those edges in this scenario, right, if the P-51 had gone to another zone, we probably wouldn't have gotten superiority. And even if they still lost the match, which they might have, but even if they had still lost the match, 
personally, the P51 would have done better, right? More XP, more credits. And generally, that might have been the key that flipped things. If you've got a ground attacker working that hard, you know, if you can flip one extra zone, it's much harder for us to keep up. They may have forced me out of the middle, which is really what happens when you flip those edge zones. You force defending aircraft out of the middle, and then once they leave the middle, you can go in and take it much easier than when a human pilot is trying to foil you. So just my two cents and a little bit of tactics and advice on those um, sectors, especially the five sector maps that have an airfield in the center. So there you go. Uh, great plane. Um, if you're flying it, hope you enjoy it. Let me know how you've got yours set up. Um, tell me how you feel about it. If you've had to face off against them, have you had some success? Have you struggled with it? And last tidbit of the day, my pro tip, you're wondering why in the world is this called the red special? Why is that on the, on the screens? Why is that pasted here? Well, it's because that's the actual name of the aircraft. I did some digging historically, and this started as the JJ-1 training aircraft. China and Russia, Soviet Union had a falling out. China had to go into the aircraft industry on its own. It needed to transition from props to jets in the 1950s. This was their first indigenous jet fighter. They were very proud of it. It was called the Red Special and then codified as the JJ-1. Um, and then this was an armed variant that was considered uh, the JL-1A-37. Uh, obviously armed with 37 millimeter, as opposed to the 23 that the JJ-1 was uh, armed with. As it turns out, there wasn't a whole lot of need for a jet trainer. Uh, people who could fly fast props could also fly jets, is what China found. Um, and so this ended up not being anything more than a concept plane. Um, but it was built and it was used as a trainer. And because it was the first indigenous aircraft, it's pretty famous. It does sit in a museum um, in China um, and uh, pretty incredible there. Uh, to see it in action. I think I might have accidentally cut off. Um, yeah, accidentally did. So this is from airliner.net. David Ledsher, I think, credit to him on the photograph. Um, but you can see how close it is. The combat version here, they just chopped down to one pilot instead of pilot and trainer and then added the guns. These side intakes, by the way, were all the rage in the 1950s. You see them on U.S. aircraft as well. Um, for example, F9F, um, some of those. Um, and it really helps with this. So cool aircraft cool history it is the red special that's the name that's the trivia for today and if you don't like red special yeah just call him jj that's the way i think i'll go uh good luck this weekend if there's anything you'd like to see uh let me know i do have a replay next week from someone who's never been on this channel before and it'll be a pleasure to um uh, chop up some gameplay tap uh, tactics and tips with them and uh, to show that to all of you so until then good luck and good hunting